I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zayas Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode one of Mark's Adventures, Rise of the Rune Lords. That's right. Today we're going to be talking about the very first long-term adventure that our group ever played in Pathfinder. So you could even say that that was like part of a path towards where we are now. Um, I, I would say that. It's also a was an adventure path that picked up quite the body count. So if you've been <laughs> if you've been um, paying attention to any of the other Marks and Linda's adventures, and at the beginning of each episode where we're like naming the PCs, and you're like, okay, okay, I watched every episode. This is the sixth time you've told me about. <laughs> Uh, Captain Rin from Skull and Shackles. It's going to be more important for this series because it's not going to be the same ones yeah, our, um, in every our episode. Our list has, a ca has categories current characters, which are the characters at the end, retired characters, which had several, Noah's dead characters for the characters from the player Noah who died, and everyone else's dead characters. That's right. Everyone else lost six characters and Noah lost five. So Yes. The and three the, by the way, retired. Uh, uh, and five... PCs made it to the end, so the high, the largest category was everyone else's dead characters. So, uh, so our definitely like our conclusion with this AP is that the villain should have won, because like it really wasn't fair for us to be able to keep, uh, to keep pulling more PCs out of the aether, especially when it's like, oh come on, you have more thirteenth and fourteenth level people. I mean, this AP started. And I think I think we started this in like 2009 or 2010. It was we started it like re very slightly after the Pathfinder RPG came out. We yeah. had our brand new core rulebook. I was con I converted everything to Pathfinder myself. The anniversary edition, which I have here right now, um, uh, which came out in. Let's look at this anniversary edition. Where is the copyright? It came out in 2012 by then we were in book five and almost done with book five mm -hmm. uh so it took a while to run it because of the fact that also we need to re sometimes characters retire because their players left yeah well because this was and also it was a in college so people college, graduated people left people graduated all sorts of all sorts of stuff happened but this campaign this campaign had several sort of restarts as uh, as we had new cohorts of people coming in, and we did actually manage to finish it in the end after That's after right. several years. Yep. And so then, let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, we actually started by talking about the meta, but we can now start at the beginning, and the beginning is talking about the actual starting characters. Mm-hmm. So let's see. The actual see. starting heroes of Sandpoint. Well, I can certainly start by talking about my character. Okay. Uh, Aedor and the Elf. A uh, at the time he was just a wizard, um, and uh, and my my sort of path with this character was in part inspired by the fact that we rolled for stats and I rolled ridiculously well. So I was like, well, I can put a really high int, but I want to use other stats too. So. Adorn started as a wizard and kind of went down the fightery Eldritch Knight route. Um, he is totally one of those characters that is very obsessed with discovery and knowledge and not so good at interpersonal skills. Um, so that was that was kind of an issue with him for him throughout the campaign, especially being an elf dealing with uh, a lot of people from these uh, shorter-lived ancestries. That's right. And he had a particular interest in um, in ancient history, which was certainly relevant as as the history of Thassalon became more and more central to the campaign. Yep. So, in addition to that, we also had, let's see, in the initial group, there was... Um, so, that was Aedorin, mm -hmm. or that was his nickname, because his actual name is Aekura Finwistara Maldivantil. Um, well, elf names are, can be really long, and no one wanted to deal with that. So. Well, there's also um, <laughs> one of, one of the initial heroes of Sandpoint was Finn, or Finn, Finn Duilas Telcontariel, who was a half-elf, um, half-elf monk druid, although not like 
not all at once, because mm -hmm. you multi-class by level in Pathfinder First Edition, who was um, affectionately known as the Monk of Missing. Yes. <laughs> because she she had a special ability called Flurry of Misses, where she um, she flurried and missed a large number there, of times. It, it was a combination. Uh, it was a combination of a little bit of some low bonuses combined with uh, combined with some chronic strings of bad rolls. Bad rolls. It was Chained Monk, and she, she had, like, a lot of, of um, her stats. She had a very high charisma, mm -hmm. which are not... It's not a stat that you really need for Monk or Druid, but um, that Finn had. Yes. It was actually very helpful to her later on, as we will see. Yes. So, well, she, was, um, she was definitely good at a lot of skills, and she was fun to roleplay with. Yep. So, um, yeah, there was that was Finn... Um, we also had Zan, or Xanthan, the, um, barbarian who was a, um, a Talden nobleman, um, who just, like, he was not the stereotypical barbarian who was, like, living mm -hmm. out in the wild in hide armor. He was, like, very fancy, um, uh, guy with his, um, uh, rondolero style, um, Falcata and and buckler and that kind of thing, but he would throw all caution to the wind when you get him angry or insult his pride and mm -hmm. just start two handing his weapon and attacking people very inelegantly. So it was a different kind of anger and rage than um than the stereotypical one. Um, let's see. Oh, people have been talking about uh, Oh, it's nice if Phrasma approves. Catch alive the whole way through. Of course, was a Vegas. Well, Adorin was an elder tonight and did manage to survive to the end. I he was the say, only PC who survived. To I would the say end. it's a combination. Oh wait, no, he wasn't. No, no it, it wasn't. was a combination of me. It was a combination of me, of course, like not dropping out of the campaign, and also his general tactics to his general tactics when things got bad to grab as many PCs as possible and Dimension Dora out and then come back for the other bodies later. Yep, that's true. Uh, if you're some other PC, door fairy for the flights, then one other, at least live. one other PC survived but retired. Yes, Adorn survived and was in the party at the end. That was what was his claim to fame. Mm -hmm. All right, so we also had Luis the Tank Stone, Luis Stone, uh, the Paladin. Uh, let's see, six foot ten and twenty one years old, the son of a retired Paladin, uh, Xavier, and a cleric bard named Sandy. So. Uh, Luis was a, uh, a cleric, uh, or or a, a paladin. paladin of Iomide, who was inspired not just by Iomide, but by the, also by the idea of following the path of Iomide and one day becoming a god. Mm-hmm. So, um, so the, the player wrote this, wrote, started writing a, a, this, this log that was Luis's guide to defense that was this, like, large page this log of like the adventures of the party but through the perspective of making it seem like Luis was the best and all of us were so glad to have him around because he was awesome like Luis is definitely extremely arrogant extremely mm -hmm. like his feelings on his own goddess is uh, is more like she's awesome and a role model because she became a god like I will one day do. <laughs> and at that point I will prove that I am even the superior god. <laughs> and she'll she maybe she'll work for me like she did for Aridin. <laughs> um he was also fearless to 99% of everything, but he later found something he was actually afraid of in part 2. Um, but yes, Luis is very interesting and he was all about like spreading his own reputation. And to be fair mm -hmm. to him in part one, there were several parts of it where like everyone dropped except him or like the party got split and the side that was with him was fighting a much harder thing with him and like one other person and the other person dropped and then he just beat the rest of the encounter himself because he had the Pathfinder Paladin advantage of, you know, lay on hand. By that point, he had lay on hands and very high AC, and they, they just couldn't hit him. And when mm -hmm. they did, they couldn't keep the damage on. Uh, so also, uh, we have Luis's opinions about the other characters. So let's see. Then there was the wizard Aedorin. He was, uh, Luis believed Aedorin was a half-elf, 
Which, oh, come on. It said Aaron, he was I a half-elf who travels the world to examine all the magic the world has to offer. Oddly, I don't remember him using any spells. Instead, he uses a beautiful longsword in an unconventional way. He throws the sword, and I assume by magic the sword returns to him. Odd magician, but I support his use of a longsword. That's yep, what Luis said right about him. Um, let's see. Luis said about... Uh, oh, Xanthan was funny. About Xanthan. Xanthan confused me when he first wandered onto the battlefield. Dressed in noble's clothes, I initially worried some civilian had gotten lost and now needed my protection. Then he suddenly pulled out... Oh, it was a falchion. That's right. Not a falcata. Yeah, I, yeah. I had it... I, 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 I confused the FALC weapons. Falcata mm -hmm. wasn't out yet. Uh, and charges to the goblins. While his fighting style was full of holes in his defense, he attempted to make that up with the ferocity to attack the goblins. Let's see. Luis said, that brings me to Finn. She claimed she was a highly trained <laughs> monk and did fight with the quarterstaff. However, she never hit any of the goblins. More so than any of the other people here, I had trouble believing she was actually a warrior. Luckily, due to her inability to hit anything, the goblins tended to ignore her. The entry was <laughs> signed, Luis, quote, hero of Sandpoint Stone. That's correct. Yep, that was where the Monk of Missing meme. That, that, that definitely came from there. But also, there were three other initial heroes of Sandpoint. We had a pretty big group. Mm -hmm. There's the Halfling Carnation. Um, she uh, is b basically a stereotypically stereotypical Halfling rogue. Um, goes sneaking around and um, generally anything you would expect from a Halfling rogue. The character didn't really have that much more to her than that. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. like the first Pathfinder character. This player was very experienced with Dungeons and Dragons too, but mm -hmm. just kind of wanted to do something simple for this one. Um, since that was one of Noah's characters, uh, I don't have to say anything else. Um, <laughs> that was the first of Noah's characters. That's correct. <laughs> uh, that's correct. Let's see. Louis, Carnation may Louis, have had Louis, more story if, if she lived longer. Louise says the Halfling Carnation was a friendly little one. Her fighting style wasn't very straightforward. It looked like she was one of the better fighters for the mob that joined. Although most of these Halfling Rouge types are evil, I found that Carnation definitely brings a good name to all her people. Oh, Halfling, Halfling, Halfling Rogue stereotypes. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> Leo, the... Oh, yeah. Then there quiet, were two yeah. clerics who joined the group. Um, one of them was Ilana... Who, if you um, if you remember about Lorena, the cleric of Shellen from uh, mm -hmm. Council of Thieves, who was the sister of Ilana, then you know that um, Ilana, Laren, Lorena, and um, whatever the last Elena and Elena. They were uh, all like mixed up. No, no, Ilana, Laren, Lorena, and the last one. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, they all it, like had the same general sense um, and were clerics. We're of all Shellen clerics of Shellen. Let's see. Louise said she was a cleric of Shalad and helped heal through the pitiful damage the goblins dealt to me. However, this is more helpful to the rest of the party who are not as well educated in the ways of defense. She enjoyed art, painting in particular, which she said helped show the beauty from her goddess. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least is Leo, the cleric of Irori. Let's see. It says, Leo was the other cleric who I met at the fight. He was a cleric of Irori, god of perfection. He was about as powerful as Alana, but more focused on self-perfection. He is a quiet man, and I do not know much about him. Yep. He was a... a I, I still like the first sense of this. It's like, after the chaos, the goblins call, cause have been resolved. I met with the rabble that assembled to fight out the Assembled goblins. around me to right, fight out the, the goblins. Rebel that, yes, the, the rabble that had assembled around me. <laughs> to fight out the goblins. The so six that of was, that was them me. were very colorful characters. Yes, so we, we, were, <laughs> we were designated the rabble who had assembled around him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, that, uh, Luis was definitely a very amusing character. Yes, it's definitely that's true. that's, like, how he talked the entire time. Yep. His eternal monologue, you could tell that he thought he was the best, also. That's the correct. he talked. No, Paladins have to be honest. No matter that. how high the odds, including <laughs> one time when he tanked a fight that, statistically, there is, like, a one in a million chance that he survived for as long as he did. Mm -hmm. Like, he was actually, like, a defensive badass, but mm -hmm. he was super arrogant. All right, so those were the initial seven heroes of Sandpoint. So, for anyone familiar with uh, Rise of the Rune Lords, which has become sort of a Pathfinder icon, mm -hmm. it's no surprise that the Adventure Pass starts at the Swallowtail Festival, a festival of the goddess Desna, a goddess of travel and freedom and butterflies and dreams and sparkly things like that. Mm -hmm. Um where they release a bunch of swallowtail butterflies and generally are very Desnan in the small town of Sandpoint, which uh, is the town in Varicia where everything started. That's also mm -hmm. based off of creative director James Jacobs' hometown with a so very slight name change. 
So that's why. Uh, so that's why you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of adventure hooks that that start in that small town that really mm -hmm. seems to be a mimetic magnet for trouble. Sure is. <laughs> sure is. So everyone came to the Swallowtail Festival um, right at the beginning. I think Luis kept a record of um, what happened at the Swallowtail Festival too. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yes, it said. Mm -hmm. Louise said, I wandered into a town to embrace a large celebration. Asking around, I see this related to some sort of fire. I decided to stay around. Perhaps I can find a way to sway the hearts of the town folk and lead them into the religious arms of Iomide. I wander into a bar. Apparently, there's a challenge here for a reward to be given to any person who can down an entire mug of some nasty tank water. I want to take a shot at this, but feel that it would be better to do this at another time. Hundreds of people wandered the streets, chattering back and forth about random things. I decided this was a great time to spread the word of Iomide. It feels great spreading strength through the religion of Iomidae. I love the feeling of giving people power and inspiration. I don't draw a full crowd, but my great speaking convinces a few stray souls to see the light. It was definitely a great day. Yep. That um, And that's how it starts. That, um, I, Using some ideas that people had on the Paizo forums and some of my own ideas, created some like additional festival games and challenges that the PCs could take part in. Mm -hmm. And that is just sort of the very beginning of the EP. But as all these things come to in any good story, there's a giant goblin ambush in the middle of the festival. Or at the end, at the point where they raise up the fireworks. At the, it becomes the end of the festival, whether it was sure planned to be or not. does. Um, and suddenly, goblins attack. They poured out into the streets, started to, like attack but also like haphazardly eat food that was out in the festival and mm -hmm. do all sorts of other weird goblin like hygiene. And they were just attacking with like random scraps of sharp things and they weren't they certainly weren't very coordinated opponents. Yes. They definitely weren't. Although there were the the PCs after they dealt with that uncoordinated mob of goblins uh met eventually um, realized some of the goblins were commandos who were more coordinated than others. Mm -hmm. And so they, they wound up dealing with pockets of goblin resistance that were significantly buffed due to the fact that there were seven characters um, to include some pretty um, some pretty rough goblin um, groups that were either very large groups of very like incompetent goblins or had more mm -hmm. of the goblin commandos. Uh, let's and see. certainly we had some pretty large groups uh, that we were fighting against here because we had a seven-player a seven-player group as well. Yep, and their goblin war chanter bards to buff the team. They were singing their goblin songs that have since become iconic um, mm -hmm. for all the goblins. And um, in general, the party did pretty well, mostly thanks to um, like. Luis being able to tank a lot of it was important. Zan took down, and, and Carnation took down a lot of things. Adorn was throwing his sword everywhere. Mm -hmm. Universalist uh, wizard. Yep, universalist wizard. Let's see what Luis said about the goblin assault. He said, I held off a goblin assault on the city <laughs> today. Let me start from the beginning. I just enjoyed my stay at the Sandpoint Inn. As I wandered the area, the populace suddenly started to panic. Being a prepared defender of people, I was fully prepared in my glistening breastplate armor. I drew my longsword, readied my shield, and charged into the commotion. I arrived on the scene to see about eight goblins setting fire to buildings and causing general mayhem. I engaged the goblins, and I'm soon joined by a mess of fighters. I see among them an elf wizard wielding a sword, a pair of clericy looking people, a halfling, a person fighting with her fists, and a noble-looking man with a frenzied fighting style. Most of them did not look like part of an organized militia. It's obvious my brave standing up against the invaders caused these citizens to take up arms and rally against the goblins. Although not all the help were great fighters, especially the monk, who did very little damage but refused to wield a weapon. With me coordinating their effort, we easily drove the goblins back. Me and the ragtag mob the continued ragtag through the mob. city. We ran into another dozen goblins in a courtyard around a cart, including two goblin casters. Although they had more than our last encounter, I gave our team superior tactics, and my party <laughs> and I continued to drive goblins away. The sounds of battle started dying as we continued wandering the streets. We then ran into the last group of goblins. They were enclosing around a cornered man. I sprang into action and ran to put myself between the defenseless man and the ravaging goblins and their dog. While the goblins attempted to bring me down, I used my great defensive stances to hold them at bay while the rest of my group dropped the goblins. After rescuing the man, most of the fighting had died down. 
Word had spread quickly of the fights I had led our group through. We had apparently fought through a substantial amount of the goblin force, and the city defender captain himself said the battle might have gone diff much differently had we not been around. The citizens of the town called us a different thing, and as we walked the streets, people shouted with cheers for the heroes of Sandpoint. You know, I think Luis <laughs> would be happy that his ridiculously biased chronicle of events <laughs> is now being used as a source. Yes, it's being used as a source. <laughs> I, he actually got a bard cohort eventually, mm -hmm. specifically to promulgate his his significantly biased version of but reality. not but not false mm -hmm. version of reality, just very skewed. Yes, and. They indeed did save the noble Aldern Foxglove it, during a fight in which Finn actually got, like, I think her only hit of the entire goblin attack mm -hmm. and saved Aldern Foxglove, and he developed an obsession for her. Um, so that is something that happens in the EP. For those of you not familiar with it, Foxglove mm -hmm. develops an obsession for one of the characters. And since she was the one who he credited with saving her, we getting that final blow in. Mm-hmm. That was her. Yep, that's right. So, um, let's see. After that, the party was um, hailed as Heroes of Sandpoint. And um, in general, there's a little bit of an interlude where people are just very grateful to everyone. Uh there's some, uh, and there's some like little mini events that happened during that time. For example, um, Aldrin Fokov invited people to a boar hunt, um, that they went out with him and enjoyed that. There was a goblin in a closet who had been trapped there and had like eaten the face off of, um, some woman's husband and killed the dog that was in the house, uh, and the PCs managed to take down that last straggling goblin. And, of course, um, local village, um, I guess, f local village flirt, Shayless mm -hmm. Vinder, um, the daughter of, the younger daughter of the general store owner, decided to um, take the noble, um, the nobleman Xanthan, who was, like, very fancy noble, mm -hmm down to the basement to help fight rats, which he absolutely was eager to fight rats. Mm -hmm. And when he found out that it was not about fighting rats, he was mm -hmm. very unhappy. Mm -hmm. And he revealed, not yet mentioned in his backstory, because not everyone had as giant a mm -hmm. backstory, uh, his character's wedding ring. Because mm -hmm. uh, his character was married, which we discovered at that point. Yep. Um, it, w it was funny, though, because he's like, where are the rats? Why did you lie to me? I'm here to assist you with rat fighting. Yep. He's married and faithful to his mm -hmm. wife, even though he was exiled from um, from Taldor for um, going into a rage during a one-on-one -on -one duel that was supposed to not be lethal and killing the other person. Mm -hmm. um, so, that kind of... Busted a little bit, but I don't know. It was still pretty funny. I, I don't think it busted. I thought it was funny. It was pretty funny, and the player is like, uh, is definitely very socially conservative, so mm -hmm. it wasn't very surprising that that um, his character refused. Mm -hmm. And it was very funny because I'm pretty sure that he also thought that it was going to fight rats too. Yes. And um, no, it was it, it was definitely interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a good choice, and it made sense that she would go after the noble men yeah. and not like uh, necessarily uh, like Luis was a good second choice because mm -hmm. of his paladin bravado. But he's a paladin, so you don't expect yeah. paladin to go for that. But like the aloof elf or like the weird uh, withdrawn uh, cleric of Aurori and some of the yeah. other ones were were not as obvious of a choice. Uh, yes, Coriolis Storm, that's exactly right. Where are the rats? Why are you undressing? It was, mm -hmm. that was pretty much... Yep. That was pretty much how it went. Mm -hmm. It's like, why aren't there rats? He was very disappointed that mm -hmm. there weren't any rats. Yep. So, uh, that whole interlude was, um, was sort of dealt with, and then, um, there was the grim news from Mosswood, which is when Shalalu and Osana, the, um, elven ranger, who... Hates goblins so much she spends, like, her whole life out there just watching them to report back about how much she hates them. Mm -hmm. uh, comes back to report about how much she hates goblins, uh, who she has been watching. 
and says, oh my gosh, they've been working together. Um, I mean, she says it a lot quieter because she's incredibly withdrawn. Mm -hmm. One of the many um, characters in APs who is like the stereotypical, well, I want to describe this character as attractive, so I guess I'll give the character a very weak personality because they have low charisma mm -hmm. uh that we that are unfortunately in some uh yeah. ap's Adorn, Sha Lu kind of yeah adorn and Shalu at one point got into a relationship that was characterized by not communicating and generally not paying enough attention to each other's concerns until they eventually drifted away and broke up because neither of them was a good partner that's true so Shalu just kind of quietly like, her f most famous quote from the AP is probably, like, dot, 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 the, el yep. the ellipsis. But she quietly explained that um, the goblins were causing problems and that the tribes are working together, which they normally don't, and that the Thistletop goblins uh, have managed to create some kind of alliance or bully the other goblins around, and it was very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so, at that point... Um, the PCs were, were, were kind of worried, but there wasn't anything they could do right now. And so they were pretty primed for the fact that, uh... We were going to have to deal with some more goblin mayhem. That adventure was about to happen, but then they didn't realize that the actual adventure was that a halfling came in and delivered them this letter that was written in, um, Japanese. Because I had found a, um... A credible Japanese translation of the letter that was from Suto to Ameko and handed that to people who didn't really know what it said, and then the halfling translated it into common. That wouldn't have worked nearly as well by the time we were playing Jade Regent, because by the time we were playing Jade Regent, like half of our half of our players could speak Japanese. Mm-hmm. Yeah, could speak at least some. Mm-hmm. And. More than half could read the, the kanji in, in there because they, they were fluent in Chinese. Yes. So. Uh, but there was a letter from um, Amiko's half-brother, uh, Suto, the black sheep of the family. And uh, the letter basically said, Oh my gosh, our father is evil and probably got the goblins to come here. Uh, and I need to meet with you in the glassworks. And... Of course, Mako had offered everyone a free room for telling stories of their adventures, so everyone was staying at her inn, and she wasn't there. Uh, she wasn't there to make them food, and she had gone missing, and they were worried. Because Mako has a very uh, powerful ability to make food that is the, considered to be like the most delicious in town, despite having almost no skill in making food. Um, oh, thank you for the gift, Oh, yeah, thanks for, for gifting, Wither King. That's awesome. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, she has, she has a step block where her actual like profession cook is, if I recall correctly, like plus four or something. It's worse. She has a wisdom penalty, I think. It's, it's an like, informed. Oh ability. no, you're right. No, it's plus four even because she has two ranks, and then a wisdom penalty. <laughs> and you it's like it. it's like it's hard to make a first level character who can't outcook her, but she has an informed ability of being the best cook in all of Sandpoint. Where the king says, "I make entrance with heraldry of sub only chat." Hear ye, hear ye. Woo! <laughs> uh, so, I see a lot of people play the adventure card game or the sanctioned PFS portion of mm -hmm. the adventure, so you get a lot more of the backstory from this. That's awesome. I'm glad to glad to help provide. So the PCs. Mm -hmm decide something's up with this and they they had heard that Ameko's father was kind of a jerk that didn't necessarily mean he had worked with the goblins but even if he did Ameko not coming back maybe the father found out maybe there was something wrong going on mm -hmm. uh the brother was a black sheep anyway so they decided that they were going to investigate and head to the glassworks into the glassworks into the glassworks so one of the things that uh, that it's like I, we don't actually have the the continued story. Yeah, Louis, we have the chapter. Luis wrote a little them. bit about um, the glassworks, uh, but it, it it didn't get all the way through. So we don't have uh, Luis's guide to mm -hmm. to defense. <laughs> um, not so much. Also, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the characters 
that uh, that died in the adventure. When Noah's characters died, he deleted the character and just wrote deceased. So we don't actually have mm -hmm. an exact record of when they died. Although some of them I remember when they died because it was yeah. a very memorable moment. Seth and Basha, I know mm -hmm. for sure. And we wouldn't have things in the wiki history because this is from so far, so far ago that uh, it was through like a port where I hand ported a bunch of pages into a different wiki server. That's right. Um, so, some of the characters who died very early in the campaign, I can't remember exactly when they died. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that... Somebody died. I think two people died in this section. At least one person died I in the I think that, that Carnation died in the classworks and was replaced with... Sa I think Carnation and Al Alana died and were replaced with Sarah, Carnation's sister, who was a rogue mm -hmm. fighter and was slightly different. And... Um, Laren, who was literally the exact same cleric of Shal. But what as literally in the description here on the wiki it says Lena cleric Alana cleric of Shal, Laren, that same cleric of Shal. That's right. The player didn't want to build <laughs> new characters, so he, he didn't really like, like uh, building characters. Uh she has a sister. And this is her sister. So they headed to the glassworks and like more or less managed to uh, get themselves into a situation that was this fight was a mess <laughs> it was a it was about as bad for them as it possibly could be due to like what would normally be considered a very good um initial um exploration where they came in through like a side door and mm -hmm. this is a giant map that's like a custom map but and it has 23 rooms but only two of those rooms are encounters mm-hmm well, the big room in the back is just full of goblins. And um, then the there's a small room down below in the lower floor mm -hmm. that has the boss encounter. So it's the assumption that you might come in through the front and then, like, goblins slowly trickle out at you? Um, no, you're supposed to fight them all in the, in the glass room, and that is what the group did. So I guess, I guess it wasn't that bad. It wasn't as bad as the other group. I ran some of this for for my like my high school group uh, mm -hmm. when I was running Rise of the Rune Lords in 3.5. They they had some really unfortunate luck. So the group managed to come in, but they came in at a at a pretty bad um, angle for them into the battlefield with the goblins, and they managed to sweep in from a direction such that they were they were on the very opposite side of a long room from another door that's really close to where to get away to go tell the boss that the encounter mm -hmm. was happening. So they come in, and the goblin's tactics are, are rather brutal, and that's how some people died, which is there's this glasswork, so there's these hot flames mm -hmm. that do massive damage if you get shoved in there. The corpse of Ameko's father, who's been, like, glassified, is, is sitting in there, like, in a horrifying position. And the goblins try to use... CMB basically to shove people into the furnace and die. Mm -hmm. And so that is what happened to um and if you're, to Carnation, if yeah. I recall correctly. Yeah, and she was I remember someone getting that someone got shoved in the furnace and I think it was her. Yeah. Because um, she was really tiny, so Ilana died straight up from just them taking down the healer. Mm -hmm. Um Leo managed to be a little more careful with what he was doing about healing and using his law domain um, to make sure that um, characters who could succeed at things on an 11 got law domain and would just succeed at everything. And he managed to defend himself. Leo was good at keeping at taking care of himself. So, yeah, Carnation became a glass sculpture. Or actually, I guess not really because there wasn't glass in there. She mm -hmm. may have just burned away. Mm -hmm. Alana had her throat cut because in PF1... The way negative hit points work, if you have only played Pathfinder 2nd Edition, essentially meant that if you got knocked low and then got crit, or even sometimes just hit again, you died. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed. No matter what level you were. So, uh, this is actually how many of the characters died, was like that. Carnation mm -hmm. being shoved into a fire that was on the map is actually definitely the aberration compared to just killed by RNG of, mm -hmm. of the game's dying system. Um... Also, the deaths that we had don't... I'm not even counting Breath of Life, um, where mm -hmm. I killed someone and then they were Breath of Life. Otherwise, if you counted that, there would have been dozens and dozens. Dozens and dozens and dozens. Yeah. Um, yep. So, the PCs managed to take out the, the goblins, but, like, they lost two party members, and it wasn't, like, a complete rout. Some of the goblins got away, and um, 
basically they were able to inform um, the boss who was down on the lower floor. Which is good for him because otherwise the room that he starts in is like maybe for his build which is like this very mobile monk rogue character is like the worst possible room you could mm -hmm. you could possibly put him in it, it, it for this group which has seven characters it's even worse because it is a 10 foot by 10 foot room mm -hmm. that he's in one of those four squares but guess what he can't flank any of the other squares yep so first of all because i had a seven player table i made all of the spaces in the lower floor be one square equals 10 feet and um, second of all he was able to get into a better position uh, he had some backup because of the fact it was a seven player adjustment and some of the enemies had escaped from above. Mm -hmm. um, so the PCs managed to fight that off. He was pretty dangerous and, and he gave them a bit of a scare, but it was nowhere near as bad as in the glasswork situation. Though he was definitely strong enough um, just from being pretty high level and having enough hit points and with a high enough movement speed that when the battle did turn against him, he was easily able to escape. Mm -hmm. uh, which also in his 10 foot by 10 foot room there's like no way he's going to get out but he's easily able to escape but he was forced to leave behind um, some of his things that he had brought down there and of course his sister half sister Ameko Marilla uh, says basically the elevator fight in Winter Soldier except you're not Captain America yep. yes yes it absolutely was that and so, and Suto is a Mako's half brother, which everyone knew, even though the uh, mother who was unfaithful did not uh, try to hide it due to the fact that he was a half elf and mm -hmm. the um, husband was not an elf. Yep. Um, so that was awkward all around and generally led to uh, Mako's father just getting really full rage from like the rune well of wrath that was like secretly under the town. And beating his wife to death and then claiming that she committed suicide. Or he may have knocked her off a cliff. Either way, she wound up off the cliff. And mm -hmm. he was not prosecuted for it because no one found out. Yes. But he was, like, you know, melted into glass by his um, bastard son. So, you know. It a wasn't lot of good things for in him. this AP are pretty dark. It's a pretty dark AP. And we haven't got, even gotten close towards part four. Mm -hmm. um so um they managed to get some of suto's journal where he'd been like doodling sketchy pictures of his girlfriend and his girlfriend really surprised um the characters who knew anything about sandpoint either from talking to the people who were around or i think that um i think someone was no maybe not that was the other one i was running where the monk was jeno was from around sandpoint so but people had heard that the um, the the Asimar daughter of the um, the town's um, surprisingly lawful sounding uh, high priest of of Desna, who, mm -hmm. despite worshiping the goddess of freedom, was like very much like I will control your life and you can only do exactly what I say, um, had died in the fire that burned the previous cathedral. And the point of this festival being so great is the new cathedral's done after the fire. Yay! Mm -hmm. um, but somehow she seems to be alive and she seems to be like turning into a demon according to this diary. And that's very disturbing to everybody. Mm -hmm. And she has some kind of a demon arm and a Mako um, in her very first uh, stint as damsel in distress will not be her last. Um, manages to uh, mention that Suto was trying to convince a Mako to come with him to their secret hideout. Uh, with the goblins at Thistletop, because otherwise Amiko was going to be killed when the entire town was massacred. Mm -hmm. And Suto loves his sister, and he did not want Amiko to die. So he, because uh, Amiko was always kind to him, uh, while um, their father was definitely not. So he wanted her to survive, and that's why he wanted to get her to come. When she refused, he was going to kidnap her to take her to a place that was safe. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, but they decided not to take her to a place that was safe. Instead, that combined with Shalalu's um, quietly muttered report about goblins gathering at Thistletop meant that the next place they needed to go was definitely the Catacombs of Wrath. 
<laughs> Not Thistletop. That's right. Where we fought Aurelium. Oh, yeah. For you see, <laughs> while they were down there, they found a secret passage that led to a blocked off area that was, uh, they, they decided that, ah, why not excavate it? Mm -hmm. And um, that led them into an ancient dungeon. So they're like, oh, why not go to this ancient dungeon? That sounds mm -hmm. like a good idea. I mean, we're adventurers, right? Everybody likes ancient dungeons. Mm -hmm. And in that ancient dungeon, they found the remnants, the, some of the remnants of, of, of Thassalon. And with, with the history DCs, which I had also raised really, really high from the, um, even from the, um, the point that they were at in the, um, original adventure, I think, but they are also high in the anniversary edition. So maybe they were just were really high, but mm -hmm. I ge I made sure to give everyone the impression that at the time before this AP, everyone had forgotten about Thassalon. It's been gone for 10,000 years. So if you wanted to know about Thassalon, you were like a scholar Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I thought was fun that was a, like a little different was that even the language itself had been dead for so long that no one knew how to pronounce it. They found the runes. Linguistic experts had studied the runes and they knew what it meant mm -hmm. because they had like Rosetta Stone like things that translated into other languages, but no native speakers were alive. Mm -hmm. So they had to make up their own pronunciation for Thassalon that was like, here's how we're going to pronounce this Thessalonian yeah. stuff, and we don't know how it's really pronounced. So, um, Aedoran was very fascinated in the lore of Thessalon, mm -hmm. and somebody actually pegged one of the checks um, on some of the Thessalonian stuff down here, despite the DC being the, uh, the, the fact that I made the DC absurd. Um, or, like, it's already DC 25 in the Anniversary Edition, too. It may, it may have been Aedoran. I was having him roll constantly, and he had, and he had really high int. He had really high in that. He had plus 10, and I think I may, may have made a DC 30, and he got a natural 20 or something like that. So, um... Because he was rolling on, like, everything. Coriolis Storm, possible. yes, exactly like, um, mm -hmm. like Minoan, um, in that regard. But it's, it's 10,000 years ago, so it's, um, I want to say that makes it so long ago that it was definitely it at the point where like it is before sumerian times for us if we went back ten thousand years um by a significant amount like when were the minoans, minoans. anyway three thousand bc yeah like at the earliest at the earliest this yes, is twice, twice as, as old far as that is the, is the earliest yeah. yeah yeah so uh that's why i added in that plot point which made it so it was a big deal when the pcs found a thessalonian speaker and learned spoken thessalonian and Aedorn got a paper published where he's like, this is the actual pronunciation of spoken Thessalonian as spoken by this Thessalonian thing that I found. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, Linda has pointed out the plus 10 bonus was from five from intelligence and five from her skill ranks. Mm -hmm. um, or his skill ranks. Because it's Aedorn's yes. ranks, not Linda's ranks. That's true. Um, so this dungeon had all sorts of fun things. Sin Spawn of Wrath. Which, if I recall correctly, the 3.5 version of them was pretty underwhelming uh, in how much damage it could deal. But I decided that in part of scaling it up for seven players, I'm making mm -hmm. there be two of them. I also had to convert it to Pathfinder, and it was wound up being a lot more dangerous than yeah. that. Um, well, it was cool to see them, though, because since Spawn were... Because it was also some of our first introduction to... You know, goblins, they're different, and then the Sin Spawn are new. So mm -hmm. even though we had played some... Even though... People have played varying amounts of 3-5. It was like, oh yeah, and this Pathfinder system has new monsters and new takes on things. Too. Right. Whereas the Vargo, some people who were experienced in um, Dungeons and Dragons recognized it and realized what a threat it could be. And they just like, they poured a lot of effort into defeating it before it could give anyone a kiss. Mm -hmm. um, That's not a kiss that you want. There are plenty more Sin Spawn. And also a mutant goblin named Corvus who had three arms, each with a different weapon, and these pits that had zombies in them. And so the PCs uh, managed to mostly avoid having to fight the zombies that were in the pits, given that they were uh, in pits. Mm -hmm. uh, it still wasn't as funny as when I ran a um, like an alpha 
play test of Pathfinder 2nd Edition for the design team of, of Rise of the Rune Lords, and they managed to almost push Corvus into a pit. He grabbed an edge in that run, and mm -hmm. then they cast Command on him, which forced him to release as his first action. Yep. <laughs> because he fell, but did not critically fail, so his first action was a release. And, uh... He then fell into the pit with the zombie and also had a huge trouble climbing out of that. Uh, I remember that too. Because uh, Jason was the one who cast it and he was like, okay, that was actually really good. Because he was like, I wonder if this is going to be any good that mm -hmm. I can command them for their first action on their turn to do something really counterproductive. Because mm -hmm. he was like, well, I can probably make them waste their second action undoing whatever the first action was. But is that going to be enough? And he's like, okay, yeah, that was really good. <laughs> uh <laughs> Um, so anyway, as Linda mentioned, the main threat here is Aurelium, mm -hmm. the Quasit Witch, or Thaumaturge, as she was in the 3.5 version. Um, we did was, not have a way to get to deal with her DR, and we were very melee. So DR, flying, invisible, DR, invisible, flying. A tiny creature with, with DR and invisibility that's flying around. Like she did, she did almost no damage, but she had some spells in the original. She had summoning and summoned some creatures, and she just eventually took out everyone except for Luis. And this is where Luis had a one in a million survival, as determined by Noah afterwards. Everyone was down. No one had died, and in fact, no one did die. She didn't do enough damage to get a kill. She would drop it. It was just like, she would do like 1d2 damage every round. And we were fighting her for like, it felt like we were fighting her for like days. The fight was so long. And Luis was so sure he was going to win, even though actually the odds were against him, that he would, he like took time to stabilize his allies. It's like, whatever. Mm -hmm. She's not going to kill me. And he just stabilized his allies during the fight. And he would find her from invisible or wait until she attacked mm -hmm. him and then ready in action um, to attack her. He wasn't good at ranged combat. And the fact, the thing that was really against the party was the fact that she has, as a closet, fast healing too. So, like, he, Luis needed to hit her often enough that mm -hmm. it was making up for the fast healing. But, and, and furthermore, she can you if she wants to, she can use invisibility to, like, leave. Mm -hmm. Which she almost did in some cases, but he he was fortunately able to stop her. He closed some doors so she couldn't get out of, out of the room and was doing some, some interesting things. Um, plus, he surprised her with a big crit at the end. Otherwise, she would have probably tried some other tactics of, like, standing perfectly still. Mm-hmm. Uh, Regardless of that fact, um, Luis managed to destroy, or maybe because of the fact, managed to destroy Aurelian uh, there in the um, in the room with the Runewell Wrath, where she where she used to summon a sin spot at the beginning of the fight. Prior to that fight, the other PCs had kind of been thinking of Luis as a bit of a blowhard, but after he saved all of our lives there, we all were just like, yeah, you know what, dude's got a point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, Aurelium was was quite quite mm -hmm. the battle and definitely was a very within a hair of a TPK. Mm -hmm. We also retired the iron die I got from my uh, from a little like Iron Heroes bo little box thing that I got for free at Gen Con that had its cool iron die mm -hmm. because it had it hadn't kept rolling the same numbers. Mm -hmm. But it was rolling. Th it was rolling numbers that were like in a range that were very poor, um, mm -hmm. to the point that's when Noah was like, statistically, this is about a one in a million that it was that bad. Mm -hmm. So we were like, yeah, okay, it's probably has some weight issues, or it's so heavy that it's like maybe yep. flattening some of its sides or something like that. We mm -hmm. don't really know. So Luis somehow managed to managed to win that fight. The funny thing is that when, when I ran it for my high school group, the monk Jeno just like grappled, he's like realized the problem, le leapt into the air and grappled Aurelium and they won. It was like, <laughs> I was like, this was much easier than when yeah. I ran it at MIT. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyway, there's also this giant like blocked off area that's completely collapsed. 
um, that the PCs couldn't get to that is beyond the scope of the adventure, but not the adventure path. We'll come back there later. Mm -hmm. So having gone on a random side mission that almost killed them all, but actually killed no one. So on average, <laughs> I guess it was less deadly than most of their missions. Yup. Um, the PCs said, okay, maybe we shouldn't have done that. And maybe we should go to Thistletop. So when they went to Thistletop, there were definitely, um, some issues that they had. First and foremost, um, the way Thistle Top is situated, there's sort of like this island that is um, built atop an old Thessalonian um, ruin in the area. And it's attached by a rickety bridge to the mainland. And on the mainland, the only approach that you can basically take, unless you want to swim through these waters that are incredibly horrible tides and will batter you against rocks mm -hmm. and probably kill you, and even then, the island is really raised up, so you'll have to climb yeah. sheer cliffs. So the approach you're going to take is through these horrible nettle thickets um, that mm -hmm. are so narrow that you're constantly squeezing unless your size is small. Mm -hmm. um, Plus, like, when there's a rickety bridge, you just know it's not safe to cross. And that rickety bridge is after you make it through all of those yeah. horrible nettles. So the PCs um, decide to go into that, but it was not good for them. Mm-hmm. If you're used to PF2 where it where being a little bit smaller does not mean you use the squeeze action. That's only for, like, contorting. Mm -hmm. But it just means, oh, everything's difficult terrain, no problem. That is not Pathfinder First. Pathfinder First, you are taking minus four to attack and AC mm -hmm. in those areas. In addition to half speed, that's kind of like everything being difficult terrain. Mm -hmm. So that that is just... Not good. Only Carnation out of everyone... Uh, or no, not Carnation. Sorry, Sarah. Sarah. Her Sarah. sister. Yes. Her sister, Sarah, out of everyone on the team... Two PCs have switched to their sisters by this point. That's right. But only Carnation out of everyone on the team is actually small. Everyone else is medium. Mm hmm So, that's not great. Um, so, the PCs are taking these massive penalties. Um, they head through. They... They wind up swinging left first, which takes them through to this area with goblin refugees from some of the other goblin tribes that have been pulled in. It's just this mass of goblin refugees um, when they manage to butcher them. Uh, but then they swing around to an area where a bunyip starts making, start howling, and a bunch of the characters fail and just start running away at random, um, which is an issue because in mm -hmm. one case... Um, you don't want to run it away at random through enemy territory that's also where you're squeezing and yeah, it was not you're next good. to an enemy fortress. It was not good. And to get to the Bunyip, they had to go down into a, like, a hole, yep. into a watery area, which they did, and they managed to kill it. But it was not necessarily a, a good situation. Um, they passed by a kennel that had some goblin dogs in there, mm -hmm. and um, they, they beat up the dogs... And finally made it into the lair of Gogmort the Druid. And his favorite friend, Tangletooth the Firepelt Cougar. Ah, uh, yes. Gogmort the Druid was operating at a big advantage. Those thistle thorns that not only were nearly impassably thick, you still could do it very slowly but taking a lot of damage. But they were considered to be non-magical uh, foliage. So therefore, Gogwar could just go through it, what were essentially the walls. With the king has scary dogs. And the goblin dogs were not that were not that particularly scary. I mean, they have that whole itchy dander thing that they have cuz yeah. they're like these weird rat dog. Creatures. Yeah, they're rat dogs. They don't yeah. they don't like regular dogs. But Gogwar was scary just because he could go through this maze of corridors just through the walls, casting spells, backing up to heal himself. Mm -hmm. His cougar could not. Um, the PCs managed um, to, uh, thanks to Finn, who actually was by this point a druid slash monk, uh, but was not quite high enough to actually have the ability to do that. But um, she managed to pull off some of her druid spells that were helpful in Shillelagh. the area. Mm -hmm. Also, she had Shillelagh. Sh Flurry of Shillelaghs. Yeah. She she missed most of the time, but she got in a pretty good hit. And then, mm -hmm. But then what she did was, once Gobrant was getting low, it seemed like he could probably escape through the hedges. But she, like, used Druidic and tried to negotiate with him. And eventually realized that Gobrant pretty much did not like the fact that his chief had signed up with this weird Longshanks lady, Nualia, and thought that 
the plan of attacking this human village not only would probably fail, but if it did, the bigger mm -hmm. human city would, would, would just genocide the goblins. Mm -hmm. And that it was just not not the correct path for the goblins of ultimate survival. So he agreed to um to he agreed magnanimously to mm -hmm. let the PCs pass, which he wasn't gonna be able to stop them anyway. Yeah. Um, but in exchange that they should try to not, like, slaughter everyone in his tribe, and he will try to convince them not to do this plan if the PCs can take out that Longshanks lady mm -hmm. who was telling the chief to do the plan, and probably also have to take out the chief because he'd been pretty convinced at this point. Mm -hmm. So the PCs decide to do that, and, um, they're working together with Gogmart the Druid, ish, not really working together, but hey, whatever. Mm -hmm. We um, came to an agreement. Yep. So, um, the PCs, through a combination of noticing that the rope bridge is rigged to collapse and Gogmart also telling them that rope bridge was rigged to collapse. And just inbuilt it, fear of rope bridges in general. They came to the conclusion that the rope bridge was rigged to collapse, which mm -hmm. is correct. So, um, they had a plan. They sent their only size small person who could clearly get across the bridge safely because goblins can. Um... Mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, Sarah. Sarah. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to say Carnation again, so yeah. I had to say it right. Sarah, they sent across on her own. Um, Sarah was supposed to just hide on the other side on the island all night while the rest of the party rested. And then she would drop a rope as the party did go through those horrifically rapid waters with mm -hmm. a boat. They would be going back. They were going to get a boat. They were going to rest. But mostly that they had to get the boat for this plan. They were going to mm -hmm. row it carefully over in a spot where it was hiding, like, in the shadow of being so far below the island that no, you'd have to look straight down yeah, to see Yeah, and the people from the watchtowers wouldn't be able to see from that angle. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, but then um, Sarah will have dropped a rope, and the party will climb up the rope. Mm -hmm. And they were going to get onto the island. So, this... If this sounds like it is a plan that could be very dangerous, the surprising thing is, Sarah is a very, very good at hiding. Maybe not as good as a goblin, but goblins mm -hmm. are not good at spotting. She managed to camp out. Mm -hmm. She didn't get noticed. She found a safe place to sleep. Surprisingly enough, this was this was not immediately when when yet another one of Noah's characters died. Yeah, <laughs> it's shocking. No, uh, but in fact, Snow Sarah survived that. Uh, however, the party gets their boat. They do it. They have good enough sailing to get through the rapid areas. They do it in a place where the goblins can't see. Mm -hmm. They get to the rope, and it's knotted. It's easy to climb. Luis goes first because it's Luis, mm -hmm. and he gets to the top successfully. He's really loud, though, and the goblins all notice him. Mm -hmm. So, they get into a fight with the goblins who had, up till that point, been, like, playing a game where I think they, like, bash pigeons, like, with a, as a flail into things. Yeah. Or some ridiculously um, evil goblin game that they were playing. Oh, yeah, it's called Kill Gull. It was seagulls, not pigeons. A uh, seagull is caught on a 30-foot length of twine tied to its leg while the far end is held by a goblin. The other goblins take turns trying to pelt the gull out of the sky with thrown rocks while the goblin holding the twine tries to help the gull avoid being hit by pulling on it. Yep. There you go. So they all um, decide, and once again, um, the counter upgraded for having more people, mm -hmm. uh, that now it's time to attack the very loud paladin that just came up there, and Sarah decides to help. So the goblins do that, and one of the, the there are a few problems uh, for the PCs. One of them is that like this is a very long climb, mm -hmm. and so they they didn't necessarily want to have like a lot of people stuck climbing it at a time. So they were gonna have like Louise tug for people to come up. Mm -hmm. uh, the goblins also kind of noticed that the rope was there, proving that this was a good idea because they cut the rope mm -hmm. um, during this fight. But also, so basically, Luis and Sarah, who came out of hiding to give Luis some backup, had to fight this entire encounter meant for the entire party themselves. Uh, this resulted in Sarah getting knocked unconscious and Luis defeating the entire fight. Yes. That was meant for the entire party. He then um, 
took a backup rope that he had brought and dropped it back to the party. And it was long enough because they didn't have a second one. Mm -hmm. And the party climbed up and got on there. But it was like, it wasn't an easy fight for Luis. He was definitely hurt. Mm -hmm. um, but he did win. And Sarah was taken out like very quickly. Um, and when we got to the top, we had clerics. So we were able to fix sure the problem. sure did. Legendary. The legendary, King. indeed. Yes. Lu uh, don't trust me. Luis wanted to make sure everyone knew about, oh, yes. about that. And about <laughs> how he cleared the entire entryway of, like... Because normally there's four goblins and four goblin dogs that are up there. And I think what I did was I, I upgraded it slightly in number and quality yeah, of the Yeah, because you, the, you, you, uh, you in a lot of places that ended up putting, like, some more of the war chanters and commandos when it had just been standard. That's ones. right. And um, I kept the dogs the same, except mm -hmm. for I, I think I may have added a few, given them regular dogs, and then upgraded some of the goblins. So, Luis just took it all out. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point, the PCs kind of just commandoed through the dungeon, uh, taking down encounters. Some of the encounters started adding together to each other, but the PCs just started slaughtering through the encounters. Mm -hmm. They made their way, and they found the demon hidden in the shed, which was a... How much did we actually try to... A giant you, horse. How much did we actually try to use non-lethal here? Did we? Or did we just I mean, you didn't, you didn't to execute the ones that you dropped. Okay. That was where the PCs were going with that. They did not go out of their way to execute the enemies, even though it was possible that the enemies could heal and come back. Uh, but they did not use non-lethal. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. I didn't remember. I know our party, like, as a whole, weren't necessarily great people, particularly later on, but... They were not. Um, the party had a party charter for the Heroes of Sandpoint that was also, like, particularly cruel to cohorts, mostly mm -hmm. because they didn't want cohorts to get a share of the treasure, um, where it was that, like, everybody got a share, and if you have a cohort, then... Um, they don't get anything, but if you want, you can give them some of your money. Mm -hmm. uh, they had particular things in their charter that were based on, I think Noah helped establish the party charter. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this became very, very relevant much mm -hmm. later yes. about the party charter. We're not going to hear about when it actually mattered tonight because, of course, no one has cohorts yet. Yeah, yeah. So they just started, like, murdering through these goblins. Groups added. They murdered through those groups. They reached the demon who was just really a horse that was in the shed. And they eventually came across that all the rest of the goblins wised up eventually, although some were sleeping off pickle stupors or other things like that, and just joined up with Ch War Chief Rip Nugget. And there was a massively epic fight with Rip Nugget on his gecko climbing the walls and... Uh, all sorts of goblins that had added into this encounter. And it was tough. Rip Nugget looked like he was really going to um, be a major threat to everyone. And he did mm -hmm. drop a bunch of PCs, but nobody died in that fight either. There's a lot of suspense though, right? Because yeah. you know I've killed so many people's characters that you'd be like, is this where someone died? It could have been. But they managed to they managed to not get any deaths. Uh, mainly... Um, Rip Nugget is very accurate, and um, he definitely had a lot of mounted combat and spirited charge. But he doesn't hit, like, super duper His beast hard. damage wasn't that high, yeah. other than the fact that it was a spirited charge. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you can block him from doing his charge, then he, yep. his damage goes down by a lot. If you can engage him, and he doesn't crit you, he probably won't kill you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... Uh, he was level 6, so he did have iterative. So he did get to make a lot of attacks. The original wasn't, but mm -hmm. my version was. Uh, the PCs had a lot of people. So, um, yeah, they they cleared that floor. And they took out the goblin who was trying to alert the next floor. Which took the goblins a really long time to decide to do that. Mostly because, like, they don't... Other than the war chief who's been charmed by New Alia's, mm -hmm. like, evil plans, then most of the rest of the goblins, like, don't really necessarily like, um, the, the, like, the human, the longshanks who have gone down there. Yeah. And some of them are a bit, uh, like, Br Brutasmus the bugbear, um, Shalalu's, like, nemesis is also mm -hmm. down there, but even he is, like, a bit much for, for some of them, so they decided just not to go down to there until... Too late for them. The PCs stopped them from delivering a message and then rested. 
Mm-hmm. Um, they they actually rested camping out in the stairwell because they um, they wanted to take out anyone who came up mm-hmm. uh, before that person could alert about anything. Yes. So they rested in the upper part of the stairwell um, and to prevent any communication between the the first floor and the second floor and get some ambushes on enemies who tried to come up. Then it worked pretty well. Yeah. So um, at that point, they were back to full. They'd taken out this entire first floor and they were ready to experience the second floor of Thistletop level two. Uh, or actually, it's Thistletop Dungeon Level 1, because mm-hmm. the first one is considered to be, what is that, like the Goblin Fort of Thistletop? Is that the deal? Or no? Um, let me see. Is this No, yeah. The Dungeon Level 1 is yeah, below the down, fort. Yeah, it was down, yeah, yeah. So area C is it's like Thistletop the Island area, plus the And then you go down plus into the, the, the thing, yeah, yeah. yes. So the second level, which is mm-hmm. called Dungeon Level 1. Yes. Um... So the PCs came down the stairs. It takes them into a room where, um, like, just off that room, they find the Chieftain's Harem and Boothasmus the Bugbear, and they get into a fight pretty much right away. Mm -hmm. Um, They do manage to um, to take down the Chieftain's Harem. I think think Shalu actually talked during that fight because she really doesn't. She wasn't there. Was she not there? Um, Why didn't we have her there? Who 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 was she really upset with when we were fighting? Shalalu is um like watching the exit and picking mm-hmm. off other goblins and making sure okay. she gets things to sample okay. or something like that. She only joins you in part three. That's right. That's right. I can't remember, but I can't remember who uh, there was some enemy that we fought at one point. That no, she it was, was him trash because he, he escaped. Okay, so I was remembering it correctly. That that's it correct. Him. Okay, he escaped and you eventually hunted him down with Shalalu. Mm-hmm. Um, so Budasmus managed to get away, but um. Do, the PCs really, really didn't want him to get any news to his other allies there, so they blocked off the doors. There were a lot of doors. There mm-hmm. were um, there were six doors out of the room, not counting the stairs leading up. They managed to block off all of them, except the stairs leading up, so he escaped out of the fort. Yes. And that's when he ran into Shalalu again. So we, I did a cutscene between Shalalu and uh, Brutasmus and let, um, I think... One of the players play Shalalu and um, for the attack combat roles, and Dad heard say she actually said some things to him, and she took him out as mm-hmm. he uh, as he escaped, but did not really escape. Uh, so she got some closure on her nemesis there. So after that, there are a lot of different ways you could go. The PCs happen to go to the Cathedral of Lamashtu next. That Cathedral of Lamashtu is full of death hounds. It could be worse if you go at the wrong time. Everybody in the dungeon is there for a ceremony of Lamashtu. Because we hadn't had enough, like, various things scream and then people Various screaming scared. dog monsters yes. or whatever. So, the Yathound fight actually was a lot tougher than you might I might have expected for the PCs. Just both, they had a lot of mobility, and furthermore, their howl got a bunch of PCs to run away. Most famously, though, mm-hmm. most importantly for the game is Leo the Cleric. Of Aurora, you wouldn't expect him to fail, but he mm-hmm. did. And he was panicked. So he rolled randomly. So he runs out of the cathedral, because they were in the cathedral. He runs out that double door, and mm-hmm. there are at that There's point, a lot of different ways you can go. There are dungeon, three so ways you can go from that double door. Okay. Straight, left, or mm-hmm. right. So I rolled a d6 and he went left. He flings open the door. The fight is still going on. It took them mm-hmm. a while. And that takes him into area D13, a goblin art gallery. He didn't care about that. He needed to run away from the Yath Hound. So he mm-hmm. leaves that door into the next door, um, which leads to a corridor, which he flings that open into the next door, which leads into mm-hmm. a war room where they were planning on destroying the town. He didn't take any attention to that. Instead, um, the war room had multiple other ways up out of there, and um, it, it had two ways. I rolled randomly, and he went west into what was that room the research room where leary akenja the evil wizard cat evil wizard failed pathfinder mm-hmm. her and her cat familiar were hanging out with um the secret door like open to the next floor because she didn't know anybody was here mm-hmm. a screaming cleric just runs in 
runs through. He sees the only way through is the se- open secret door, and he just runs into the secret door. She And she's like, what? <laughs> so the door leads down a level. Mm-hmm. As the fight continues with the Yeth Hounds, Leo runs down into Thistletop Dungeons level 2. Continuing to run, he runs to another door, which he opens. Opening this door leads him into area E2, which is the Hellcats Hall. He makes it through the Hellcats Hall to another door. Running into there, he leads he goes to another area called the Trapped Hall. As he goes into there, two iron portcullises fall down. Um, these horrible, like... Um, glaives like swing down to hit him and then a pit opens and he falls into the pit and it closes and resets itself. He does not have uh, athletics and Mm -hmm. cannot climb the pit. Like he literally cannot climb. Yes, he doesn't have climb, yeah. No, it was Pathfinder. Oh, but it was climb though. Yeah, he does not have any climb. Climb and swim were separate. Yeah, yeah. He did not have climb. He could not climb the pit. He had no chance to climb it. His strength was low, and it was stuck, and opening the door was also a disabled device. And how do the PCs know where he is? No one knows where he went, because they were in that room. He made, like, multiple decisions while he was running and screaming, Mm -hmm. none of which the PCs knew. He was in the darkness down there in that pit. And the player of uh, Leo in our previous campaign, which uh, was a homebrew game that was Linda's very first uh, game that mm-hmm. she played, um, he was playing Adam the Paladin, who was like the stand-up guy, and the rest of the party, such as Linda, were super sketchy, mm-hmm. constantly doing evil things behind his back. So this time he was like, I kind of want to be the character who eventually becomes evil like Linda mm-hmm. and all the other people did last time. Mm-hmm. So while he was in the darkness, the Midnight Lord Zonkuthan spoke to him and was whispering to him of the secrets of the darkness. And Leo converted to Zonkuthan, keeping his <laughs> law domain, replacing one of his other Rory domains that he never used um, for the darkness domain. So like, so yeah. So, so, like, the rest of us are continuing through the dungeon, and Mark's, like, having this side chat with Leo, where he's having this whispers of, with Leo's player, where he's seeing all these whispers of Zon. Also, I have to say, having Cooper. Leo and Luis in the party, <laughs> what, instead of being, like, co-workers now, is, um, <laughs> is definitely interesting. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, Leo converts to Zonkuthan, he switches to negative channeling. The party only notices that he switched to negative channeling, which he explains is, like, he had a revelation since Aurori has both positive and negative channeling. Mm-hmm. That um, the darkness told him about the negative side of channeling, and mm-hmm. everyone bought that. Yep. Why would Leo lie? He's this. He's like a super. De- he's quiet but super dependable. And even as a worshiper of Zan Kuthan, he's still super dependable. Mm-hmm. Like he may be torturing people now, I guess, in the darkness somewhere. But he does that off screen. He is mostly, I think, thinking of the emotional torture of. Uh, being in the darkness and things like that and Mm -hmm. focusing more on the darkness aspect and he's dependable to his team and nobody knew he didn't still worship at Rory. Yep. Anyway. Because it took a while for us to find him. Yeah. We'll we'll get into that. We'll get there because they did not find him when they reached area uh, E3. Oh no. (laughs) Oh no. They did not. So, okay. Anyways, the party defeated the Yeth Hounds. Mm -hmm. So that's good, right? And so they're like, where did Leo go? I hope he's okay. Mm-hmm. And they managed to, um, they managed to. Yeah, so we, we did go back and check around the places we'd already cleared out. And it's like, he's not there. I guess he ran deeper into the dungeon. Yep. They managed to avoid the, the Tentamort entirely. But um, during this whole sort of fiasco leary came out actually managed to pass the pcs and went to find auric to ask them what was going him what was going on and he mm-hmm. wasn't sure auric is a human mercenary who's not quite as evil as the other people working for Nualia, but he was just paid to do this and he's he pretty much doesn't like what's going on and is also part of the love whatever shape it is where he likes Leary and Leary likes Suto and Suto likes Nualia and Nualia likes body horror. <laughs> um, and nobody likes nobody likes each other in a like a mutually connected thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Coriolis Storm says it's just a solid stand up dependable torturer. That's right. The kind of person who school moms bake pies for. That's true. And actually happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
Um, they went back to Leary's room just in case because it sounded like there was some kind of combat in there. And the PCs have been exploring another side area by now, so they sort of missed each other. Mm -hmm. And the PCs managed to completely avoid the Tentamort and, in fact, just never found it. Um, they didn't bother going to that room later on. Mm -hmm. But what they did go to at that point was they managed to, to, they were like, wait a minute. Why are we just going through here at random? Let's use survival to try mm -hmm. to see if we see Leo's tracks. Yeah. And they tracked, um, the, they tracked Leo somewhat, but then they lost it. Yeah. And they didn't have an hour to find it again. Fortunately, since they tracked him through that one decision, it was the three-way decision. Mm -hmm. Most of the other things after that weren't major decisions. So they managed to get to the war room, and they fought Leary and Oric together in Leary's room. They also closed the secret door because some weirdo in, in like a Rory out uh, clerical vestments came running through it. Mm -hmm. um, they meaning Leary. Leary yeah. and Oric had closed the secret mm -hmm. door and. Uh, Oric like barricaded down and like knocked over a table to use as a defensive thing so that Leary would have a lot of cover, and they tried to hold off, but the PCs were just way too much for them, even without Leo. Mm -hmm. So the PCs managed to take them down, and essentially like Leary was sort of out of control and wouldn't surrender. But after she was taken down, Oric surrendered on the um, on the sort of. Condition that the PCs would let him and Leary go because he said that they were just sort of hired hands mm -hmm. and Nualia and Suto were the real masterminds. And I think Adorn said, fine, but I get to copy her spellbook That's first. correct. I think Adorn said that he was taking her spellbook. Yeah. In exchange for her life. Oh, did I take it? Or did yes. I, okay, fair enough, fair enough. I knew I got her spells. Yes. That's right. You took her spellbook because you wanted her spells, and that would render her incapable of repreparing and being a threat. Mm -hmm. So that's what you that's what you did. Fair no, enough, you guys were much more hardball than that, Linda. You're thinking of other groups. You're right. Not, you're right. Not the heroes of Sandpoint. You're right. You're right. Our our PCs. It, it's funny, like the trajectory of our groups, because like the because the, uh, the 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 red tie campaign was full of like evil jerks and the rise of the ruler campaign was pretty sketch too but like as we've moved on they through weren't our campaigns, that sketch they were just like mean uh, jerks yeah <laughs> well we we've uh, as we progress through campaigns like our PC so as a whole have become progressively more like charitable and good aligned one thing is, is that I've been more likely to play than GM, and my characters are, like, ridiculous goody two-shoes. Mm -hmm. I may play, like, really evil villains who kill so many people as the GM, but when I'm mm -hmm. a player, I tend to be a real goody two-shoes. Not in Iron Fang Invasion, but I kind of feel bad about it. Anyway, um, so the PCs manage to find the secret door. Also, Oric agrees to show them the secret door. Mm-hmm. Um, he tells that he knows some secrets that they might want to know, one of which was the secret door. Yeah. So I mean, he, opens, he opens that up, and the PCs find their way down. So this is where it gets good, everybody. <laughs> or in a moment. So they make it to Thistletop Dungeons level 2. They're really worried, because at this point it's like, we lost track of Leo, he's probably dead or something. Like, where even is he? <laughs> I think maybe he went, he doubled back. He went into the other part of the dungeon, but we need to take out Nualia before she figures it out. Mm -hmm. And two of her four people just got taken down, and she's, and according to Oryx, she meets with them semi-regularly, so she's going to find out if we don't go now. Mm -hmm. So they decided that was the time to go. Mm -hmm. um, so they went down, they went, just like Leo had mm -hmm. before them, through the ancient door into the Hellcats Hall, and they went to the trapped hall. Now, mm -hmm. Sarah had mm -hmm. the trap spotter rogue town. Mm -hmm. So she immediately noticed there was a trap. And she said, guys, there's a trap here. A portcullis is going to come down, and then Gleaves are going to attack mm -hmm. in that pit. And so uh, they were like, that's horrible. Can you can you disarm it? And um, Sarah said, I can. And so um, Noah said, okay, I'm going to have Sarah go up there, and I'm going to like jam it with my picks so that the, the trap door can never open again. <laughs> And I said, well, uh, do you just want to disarm it so it's not a danger, but, like, you could open it later, like, maybe if the enemies were coming or something like that? No, I'm going to jam it so it never opens again. <laughs> we, out of character, did not know They did not know happened. that Leo was in the bottom of this pit. Leo did not know they were there. <laughs> and eventually his character had, like, curled up into a ball and fallen asleep where he had the dreams of Zanguthan, according yes. to his player. Mm -hmm. This had happened before the PCs got there. Yes. It took the PCs a little while. 
to muster up what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, um, it's going to be harder to jam it so it can never open again than it is to just disarm it, but roll. And, and then he rolled uh, super high for Sarah. And yes. so Sarah <laughs> jammed the door so it could never open again. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> and, and disarmed the trap. So the what the PCs really were not expecting necessarily was that they thought that Nualia would be deeper into the dungeon because Oric had described he didn't go into the second floor that often, but he or or sorry, the third floor, which is dungeon level two. But he described that that you after like the the first hallway, there's like a hallway or something, and he doesn't know there might be traps down there, and you can turn left mm -hmm. or uh, to one room and turn right to the main area where a lot of the stuff was. So they thought, okay, they're gonna be in that main area. We'll go left to the dead end room, mm -hmm. but that's where Nualia and Suto were. Um. And so, they were very surprised to, to encounter them so quickly when so much of the dungeon was still left. But also, Nuali and Suto were very surprised to encounter a group of PCs who also didn't set off the very loud trap. Now, they had heard Leo setting it off about like an hour now, now previously. The, the player of Leo has a very good poker face because yes. he's just sitting there quietly abused and yeah. typing to Marvel. He's Mark a very cli quiet up. player and he <laughs> was just, he was fine. He, he usually watches and only says something occasionally. When he does something, like, in one of the games we were playing, he was playing a Wu Jen. And, like, it was the most excited I ever saw him. Because he's usually so quiet. Mm -hmm. But, like, so we were playing in, like, the lobby of a dorm. And someone came past who was not in the group, who was his friend. He was, like, he, he called the guy over and was, like, I just did 3,000 damage. <laughs> because he had used, like, a maximized, um, a maximized empowered, or no, a maximized fireball against a group of 50 enemies. So he did 3,000 damage. Um, in any case, yeah, he's just there. And they get into this giant fight with New Alia. Mm -hmm. So I, as some uh, suggestion um, from the forums that I sort of adjusted myself. Because New Alia's backstory does not come across to anyone. So I decided that instead of making her necessarily that much higher level, since she did also have Suto, I instead was going to... Uh, have her have this Desna magic item that showed off like weird dream visions of her backstory because otherwise you never find out what it is mm -hmm. and everyone has too many journals um, I didn't want to just add another journal so these dream visions would cause like um, the, one of the PCs to have to roll a will save and potentially like be dazed as they see the visions so randomly someone wasn't necessarily always in the fight if they didn't make their will save for that turn as mm -hmm. th they saw that particular vision and then Nualia and Suto did a tag team uh, battle royale combat. Um, the main danger that they had was that Nualia was channeling negative energy. Uh, and that was doing a lot of damage. And it was, she was not afraid to use it after people had already fallen in the battle. So it should be no surprise to you then that this is where the second set of deaths occurred. Mm -hmm. um, against... Um, Nualia, sadly, Sarah, the, the rogue, um, met her sister Carnation in, in Phrasma's Boneyard. Mm -hmm. And um, it, was a, it was a very sad day for, for her. And as well, Finn, the monk, was killed, who was Alden Fox of Fixation. Mm -hmm. Oh, whoops. Um, so both of them died here uh, against Nualia, but Nualia and Suto were defeated. Yes. And uh, let's see. It says here, Finn Dulius fell in battle against Nualia, mm -hmm. the mastermind of the attack on Seth. And then Clark. they came back with, was that when Noah eventually came? And it next was came Seth, but Seth, only in part two. But only in part two. And then Kit was... Uh, Kit, no, no, no. Kit was a while from now. Who, was, who did... F uh, Finn became Kelly. Oh, right. Finn became Kelly next. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, um, the PCs uh, mourned their losses. Um, they rested... And eventually, at some point, like, Leo just decided to start shouting just in case, because... Mm -hmm. And someone heard him, and they were like, oh, crap. They're like, where's Leo coming from? And they're like, he, he couldn't be. And they were like, oh, no. Like, Wait, can't, um, uh, Sarah disabled this, so it could never be opened again. Maybe she's skilled enough to undisable it, so it can be opened. Just, she's dead. So Zan just destroyed the trap door with his falchion, <laughs> attacking it for, like, an hour until mm -hmm. it broke. And they got Leo out of there. Uh, mm -hmm. so that happened. 
Uh, then and, and, and all of us are just like, oh my gosh, Leo, we're so sorry. We had no idea you were down there. And he's just like, it's fine. No one knows at this point that he can convert. Well, out of character, he told us because he thought this was hilarious. He thought it was funny. And, and then he thought this was hilarious. So out of character, he told us out of character everything that had happened at this point in time. Yes. But no one ever figured it out in character. That's right. So um, they grabbed everyone and they went after resting up into area E5, the portal of greed, and down into the crypt where they were attacked by a bunch of shadows. Mm -hmm. They managed to take out the shadows... Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have two positive channeling clerics anymore to help mm -hmm. them fight the shadows. It's rough. Shadows are incredibly deadly. And they went after positive channeling cleric, um, Laren, uh, which unfortunately killed her with strength damage. Yes. So uh, it caused point, her to uh, rise as a shadow. Point, Alana, Laren, Finn, uh, Alana, Laren, Finn, Carnation, and Sarah have all died. Yep. Wait a minute, I just remembered something. Yes? Sarah barely survived that fight that with Noalia. And, see, Noah just left deceased. I thought she died against Noalia. Mm -hmm. I re remembered she survived like one or two hit points from negative dead, and only Finn died there. Okay. Because I remember where Sarah actually died. Was it in the shadow fight? No. Where was it? It was against Malfashnikor. Okay. Uh, I just remembered Sarah was still alive, barely. So, she was still there for that fight, but she didn't do much because they were incorporeal and they were immune to sneak mm -hmm. attack. The party had no problems with the giant hermit crab. That was not an issue. But the issue for them was when they made it into... We, we had all learned to have backup characters by this They point. made it into the back room by finding the secret hidden thing. I made it way harder to find the secret door because of the fact that Nualia and Suto had been there for like a week looking for the secret door. Mm -hmm. And it's like DC... Some garbagely low DC that they would have found in one attempt to, mm -hmm. to search for it. They literally are the laziest and stupidest people in the world if they've been searching for secret doors for a week to try to mm -hmm. find Malfashnikor. And it's a super And they could not DC. find the DC 15 secret door or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So I upped it to a DC that was exactly one higher than um, Nualia or Tsuto could possibly make on a natural 20. Mm -hmm. But that the PCs had people who could make it. Yes. And then the PCs made it. They were like, oh, wow, that was really hard to find. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, it was too hard for them. That's why they never found it. Mm -hmm. um, and they made it into that secret area where there was an illusion of Karzug speaking in Thessalonian. And that had, that had fragments of Thessalonian that Adorn wrote down because mm -hmm. it was spoken Thessalonian, but he didn't know what it was saying. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't use comprehend languages on his own writing because he was just transcribing. with. Yeah. When he wrote it, he didn't have knowledge of what it meant. Um, so he was just phonetically transcribing it. And they used Comprehensive Language to listen to it. Mm -hmm. and, but the problem is that when it translates for you, he knew that it wasn't going to be word for word. Like, yeah. So he's not sure exactly which words. Because again, they had literally no basis for the pronunciation of the runes. Some mm -hmm. of which, according to looking at the runes on the dice and some of the art, some of them are pictographic runes. Yeah. And not phonetic runes. Mm -hmm. Right? Like the rune for wrath is not a, like a ra th. It yeah. is. Just wrath. Yeah. So, uh, he still had basically no idea how to map it onto anything, but he did have some pronunciation with mm -hmm. the translation, and that was a start. That's when Adorn decided he was going to find a way to get Thessalonian into a language that people knew how to speak it correctly. Um, however, just after that, they went into Malfeshnikor's prison. They did not realize Malfeshnikor was stuck in there, uh, and they started fighting him. So mm -hmm. this was a knockdown, drag out fight, and by that I mean everyone fell unconscious, mm -hmm. and by that I mean everyone. So, what happened was Luis at zero hit points, or uh, we have a house rule that you can go to negative your Constitution modifier and be still staggered at the lowest number of possible hit points, made the last possible attack mm -hmm. that he could make. And dropped Malfeshnikor. And himself. And himself. Um, so we went to the rules for recovering from being unconscious mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're stable. Because they stabilized. Everyone stabilized. Mm -hmm. um, except Sarah, who's dead. Except Sarah. So, Sarah had died. Mm -hmm. Flat out. So, Malfeshnikor managed to... Uh, to wake up 
at essentially the same time as Luis. Because of just the vagaries of where their negative hit points were. Mm -hmm. I think now Flash of the Core was really barely before Luis. And if he had been with it enough to be like, I will, I will. Now that I've woken up, I'm immediately going to, mm -hmm. uh, going to try to kill these other people. That might have been one thing. But I decided he's a Vargas. He wants to advance uh, even more. He's a greater Vargas. You do that by consuming things. Mm -hmm. This person is dead, so he was going to miss his chance, and he can recover um, his health by eating them. So he was eat he decided to eat Sarah mm -hmm. um, quickly, and he figured no one else is going to wake up within minutes of me. I'll eat Sarah, and then I'll kill them. And Because if he killed them while he was, like, staggered, he might drop himself again. Yes. So he's he does this, and he starts eating Sarah, and Luis wakes up. He manages to land hands himself... Get back into a fight with Malfeshnikor and drop Malfeshnikor again and kill Malfeshnikor. So again, um, <laughs> Luis is, is oh, it's a raid from Evandale. Oh, hey, hey everybody, Lu uh, Luis the Tank Stone may be an incredibly arrogant um, paladin who holds himself as uh, higher in his own eyes in some ways than his own deity, but mm -hmm. like he actually was a badass. Um, Welcome everyone from Avondale. We are telling the tales of my very first Pathfinder campaign that got kind of got our group into Pathfinder, where I was running Rise of the Rune Lords. Mm -hmm. We are five PC deaths in at this point. Yes, okay? we've had five PCs die at this point. Ooh, Nicole, thanks for gifting five subs to to the Raiders, Raiders of the Lost Sub. Now <laughs> you you five Raiders who got gifted subs can make all the leshies and other emojis from uh, from RK Mark. So be sure to check it out. <laughs> um, yeah, we are five PC deaths in, and we are just finishing um, basically book one of the Adventure Path. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're going into the denouement uh, of that. So um, if you're familiar with Rise of the Rune Lords, I was running some variations. I was converting from 3.5 because at mm -hmm. the time, Pathfinder was out, but this Anniversary Edition book was not. And so... Uh, and we also generally had a uh, we also generally had a seven player group, which meant yes. a lot of upscaling. It definitely meant upscaling. It's a seven player group, so mm -hmm. you got to do that. Unfortunately, in Pathfinder First Edition, upscaling for a seven player group with the death and dying system generally meant somebody was gonna die mm -hmm. um, if the fight was anywhere close. Well, the amount of breath of life that our party was packing later in the campaign was the only reason why I trick it off. I think. <laughs> Hi, Avondale. Hi. Hey. Um, Danny, for Evandale, you're saying that five PC deaths sounds like an Evandale Friday. Do, do, um, do five PCs really die every Friday? Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, this was, uh, this was the one of three Rise of the Rune Lords campaigns that Mark ran part of. Because we had, he ran one with some, <laughs> with, some with friends from his high, old high school group. And I then, ran one encounter for you and my little brother and one other thing. And yeah, and, and for a few of us uh, way back when. So yep. we did that. Um, but So you had a little bit of the of the very start. But this was the one that we that we pulled all the way through. Mm -hmm. uh well we had it was some, some of these encounters were uh some of these encounters were pretty challenging for sure yes it's just one of it was shadows which pretty much always get mm -hmm. a kill in pathfinder first this is pathfinder first edition yeah. um there were shadows there were there were some crits there was there was a there was... glasswork scene where people got shoved into a furnace that was just in the ap and it was pretty deadly mm -hmm. crits are pretty much a killer in pathfinder first uh that that caused a lot of deaths and there's one with a room of negative energy channeling cleric who just mm -hmm. did not stop channeling when one of the PCs went down. Yes. And that's how that PC died. Mm-hmm. The Architects is the deadliest guys ever. <laughs> Which ones are the Architects? That sounds interesting. Um, so, at this point, um, P um, oh, the Shadows, yes. Shadows uh, are just the so... Shadows. They're so they're deadly. They're always deadly. So... Luis the the, the, Luis the arrogant paladin has sort of earned his mm -hmm. earned his arrogance by saving the party's bacon multiple times in a row. That's true. Uh, Certainly you can't contest that he's brave to the point of foolhardy. Oh yes. Um he eventually found something mm -hmm. in the next book that chilled even him to the bone. Yep. He literally 
to show how little he fears most things, he literally jumped off a, into a, like a 300 foot fall <laughs> to avoid fighting something that he was actually afraid of. Yep. Because I was like, he's like, I'm going to run away. I was like, but your movement speed, where are you going to go? He says, I jump off the tower. And, and Mars like, that's a lot of falling damage. Your I was like, that's going to be the die. that's going to be the maximum falling damage. You know, he's like, I can take 20d6 falling damage. I can't keep fighting this. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you sure there's a good chance your character will die from the falling damage he's like my character's definitely gonna die if i stick around here so i'm gonna take the chance of the falling damage spoiler alert i was doing wisdom drain on a touch attack to him he had seven wisdom he had seven <laughs> wisdom and his ac while it was like 40 his touch ac was like nothing yep so uh my touch attack did wisdom drain and he took like four of his seven wisdom, and he and he was like, you know, jumping off of it sounds even more like a good idea now that I only have three wisdom left. <laughs> <laughs> but we later decided maybe it was the wisest thing he could have done too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's great wisdom even in low wisdom. So the surviving heroes of Sandpoint, which to be clear, we've lost five characters, two of which were from the uh, two pairs of the same player losing basically the same character again. Yes. The only unique character who had died was um, uh, was Finn, um, mm -hmm. who was then replaced by Kelly, an archer paladin of Sarenrit, who was very interested in um, the idea of redeeming Nualia. Oh, because the party did not kill Nualia and Suto. Mm -hmm. They decided that they were going to turn Nuali and Suto into the um, the very esteemed justice system of Magnamar. Mm -hmm. uh, because after all, the PCs were just like these random people here, and Suto was the half-brother of a Mako and like the son of a major merchant in the area, and Nualia was the daughter of the like cathedral owner, mm -hmm. And but they definitely tried to murder everyone, so yeah. they should be brought in for a trial. We got to meet a really nice lawyer. That's true. So, uh, well, um, a very nice prosecutor, right? Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of fun things that I did in between the first and the f second part right here that I will, I'll tell everyone about. If you're not familiar with Rise of the Rune Lords, by the way, there's going to be spoilers for it here because this is my, my rendition mm -hmm. of what happened in that Rise of the Rune Lords campaign. So, um, the PCs turned in, um, Nualia and Suto. And they got an attorney that Suto hired because Nualia was just dejected that the Greater Bargis was dead and mm -hmm. that Lamashtu did not bless her and had forsaken her and the PGCs mm -hmm. had defeated her. So uh, the the attorney was, um, the defense attorney was like a greasy defense attorney who got off all sorts of crooks all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and was going for, like, a defense of, like, the PCs or murder hobos who just came in here, and who mm -hmm. knows what was happening, maybe the PCs. It was, it was not a good defense, um, uh, it was not a good defense for the PCs, it was smearing them. The prosecutor was worried that that was going to happen, and was, mm -hmm. came to get the PC's statement. So, the PCs had some good luck. According to the prosecutor, a wonderfully nice woman by the name of Zinesha, mm -hmm. who got them all these nice... Um, she brought us jelly donuts. She brought new pastries yeah. and, and some tea. And you had a discussion about all the tactics and strategies you guys used to fight. Mm -hmm. And she said, the good news is Justice Ironbriar is very harsh and fair. And there's no way he's going to buy some kind of slimy defense mm -hmm. argument as long as we have the story straight and there are no inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. So, so, so naturally, we, we told this kind prosecutor yes. all about all about all of our favorite tactics. Yes, and like and how we use Luis them. gave this giant thing, and Aedorn likes to throw his sword, mm -hmm. and then we, and so she wrote she wrote down all of the PCs' ta favorite tactics and spells, mm -hmm. uh, so that she would have it for the deposition. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the defense attorney had Nualia, who was already pretty non-responsive before. Um, like as part of the defense, she was just like, kind of. Really zoning out and had been given a... The defense attorney had given her, like, a dolly that um, she was supposed to be staring at mm -hmm. vacantly. And the defense attorney was like, and she lost a child. And she's just clearly um, was mm -hmm. not in her right mind. And she, she went to this goblin place because she didn't know what was going on. And sure... But, but sure enough, these PCs... Uh, you know, these... Murder hobos had not been hired by anybody. They just came out there and just started killing and fighting and never even mm -hmm. checked for anything. And he just impugned everybody on the PC's side. Like, did you, did you talk to them before you started attacking them? And they're like, well, no. But uh, it's like, 
and who attacked first and one of the PCs had one initiative. It's like, well, mm -hmm. it was us, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but Zanesha managed to not only debunk it, but she just had this really great rapport with Justice Ironbriar. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, the prosecutor who was on the PC's side there had the judge like eating in the palm of her hand. Um, mm -hmm. And... It was a slam dunk that they were, um, Nualia and, uh, so Suto was sentenced to, um, the Hells, which are, like, this really, really awful prison system. Mm -hmm. And Nualia was sentenced to, um, being exiled to Fort Rannick, a place where you se send, like, the people you really don't care about because they're just in the middle of nowhere guarding against ogres that come to kill everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like a ranger order, mostly. She was exiled to Fort Rannick, where she was supposed to um, to help them to defend against um, ogres and um, redeem herself if she was supposedly so um, remorseful about about this whole situation. And mm -hmm. um, Kelly managed to go to the, the new paladin of Sarah Ray, managed to talk to her and like try to get through to New Alia. I was trying on her path to um, to redeem Nualia before this point. Um, let's see. Um, Elftro's players were witnesses at their trial Magnamar, judged by a certain Justice Ironbriar. Also, mm -hmm. Nualia was dead, so you speak with dead to get her deposition. That makes sense. Um, so, um, yes, that was all a delightful interlude, and the PCs had a new friend, Zendesha. Mm -hmm. Um... And Justice Ironbriar was a nice guy who um, who didn't want to listen to these bad things about the PCs. And so the PCs were, were ready to go back to Sandpoint where they found out about a gruesome series of murders that was about to begin. And of course, uh, with Finn dead, mm -hmm. um, this, pre this presented a little bit of a twist that I had to pivot on that i will tell you about next time when we mm -hmm. get into rise of the rune lords part two but before we do that um let me give you some xp for the last few minutes of the show and let's say goodbye to youtube and then do some closing statements Found bye youtube me. bye